And Lord, I thank you for saving us. Lord, I thank you that, that we can come and, and talk to you and cry out to you. Lord, to make request of you. And Lord, what's even more incredible is that you talk to us, that you gave us your word, that you, that you allow us to know you. And Lord, I pray today as we, as we open up your word that we are once again amazed by who you are, by the great things that you have done. That you are a gracious, loving, holy Father. And Lord, I pray today that, Lord, much is made of you. Lord, I pray that there is conviction in this room today. I pray that there is redemption in this room today. I pray that you do what, what none of us can do. That you bring life from death. And Lord, I know today that even in this room, as small as we are as a congregation, that Lord, there are some in here that we need to cry out to you because we haven't done that or we haven't done that for a long time. And so Lord, I'm making this request for my Father that you move among your people today. Lord, I love you. And I pray that my heart is ready to deliver your word and their hearts are ready to hear your word today. Lord, I pray for our children as they go to children's church. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to them. That, Lord, we will have the joy of a, of a church watching our children be saved. Lord, please do great things in here and let us be amazed by your power and might once again. It's in Jesus' name, that powerful name, that I ask all these things. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Daniel. We're still in chapter 1. I want us to read the passage first this morning. I, I usually don't do it right off the bat, but I want to read it first, and then we'll start unpacking that. We're going to start in verse 8. And so I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask that you stand again as we honor God's word this morning. So remember, Daniel and his friends have been shipped off to Babylon. They are now uh, going to be re-educated. They're, going to, they're in a new culture, a new land. They've been separated from their families. And this is beginning for us, beginning to see what's happening here, starting in verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youth's who are your own age. So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance, fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Would you please be seated? Now, if you know me well enough, it would definitely take God's word to tell me that vegetables would make you fatter and I'm in a crisis of belief right now. I'm just, just kidding. 
What do we do with this? What is the Lord trying to show us in this passage? I read a story the other day that I thought would uh, best illustrate with where I'm wanting to go with this. On your left is Dr. Brian Chapel, and he told this story, and I thought I would relay it to you. I'm not going to tell it to you word for word, but you'll get the gist of what he's saying. There's a young couple, and the young man had felt called to ministry. He was in seminary, and his wife was supporting him. That is, that is not unusual if you go to the seminaries where you will see young couples struggling to make ends meet as the man is going through seminary and trying to follow the call on his life. So she was supporting him. He was working hard in school, going to school full-time. She was going to work. And her name was Karen. And Karen made her living as a quality control inspector at a major pharmaceutical company. So she had a good-paying job, was able to make ends meet for them to have a place to live, to pay tuition so her husband could go to seminary. One day, due to a situation, the automated machines that were making the syringes, there was a problem with them, and they were contaminated, and you can go ahead and figure this out. They failed inspection, and she was the one who was inspecting these syringes. Karen, being a good employee who took her job very serious, told her boss about the order. The boss took some time to figure out the cost. This was a huge order. He began to look at the cost, what it would be to throw all of those away and start over again, and he came to the conclusion there would be a great deal of money lost. So her boss told her, you sign the inspection. In good conscience, she refused. Well, due to regulations, the boss could not sign it. She must sign it. Without her signature, it was a total loss. So her boss began to put pressure on her to sign, but she would not budge. Things got heated. The following day, Karen did not face her boss, but faced her boss's boss, who was the president of the company. Karen was told once more, you must sign these forms. We do not want to take a loss on all of these. He would give her the weekend to make the decision, and he made it clear. Her job was on the line. The reality is this was much more than just a job. It was the only source of income that she and her husband had. It was a good paying job, and it wasn't going to be replaced very easily. It's not like she could go from there to work in at the checkout counter at Walmart and just replace her income. This was very important. Not only that, if she lost this job, the idea that you could go to another pharmaceutical company and get the same job, word gets around. That weekend, she didn't sleep much. Food didn't taste very good. And every waking moment, she felt the pressure. Her plans and her husband's plans were all in danger. Their dreams, her husband's calling. And Dr. Chapel said it like this, and I will quote him right here. For this young couple, all the theological jargon and doctrinal instruction about consecration and righteousness and holiness came down to this one decision. You see, they had been going to church and he was in ministry and they've learned all these things about righteousness and truth and, and holiness, and, but it's real now. You can learn all these facts. You can learn all these things and have a great theological all this jargon put in your head and you can say, oh man, I know the way to salvation. I know all these facts. But then it comes down to a decision and who are you going to be? I'll just leave it at that right there. Last week, we began to look at what happens when we perceive that God fails. Again, I want to remind you, I, I would venture to say, Dr. Chapel doesn't say this, but I would venture to say that Karen and her husband spent a lot of time praying that God would just 
resolve this situation that weekend. That somehow, you know, praying, let my bosses come to the realization that these are tainted syringes. We can't put those out in public. We can't do that. Just let them come to that decision. And I imagine she was crying out for God to take care of that situation. But I want to remind you the warning. You'll feel pressure to change what you believe about God when you believe that God has failed. I imagine Karen asked the question, why am I in this situation? Why have you not resolved this? Why haven't you taken care of this? I want to remind you that when God's thoughts and ways do not line up with our thoughts and ways, many times we'll think that He has failed us. And the problem is we either have a false view of God or our faith was in something other than God. The only way that you and I can have hope in the midst of change is that we must put our hope on the one thing that is constant, and that is the Lord. Amen? And you're about to see, we've just read it, but you're about to see that it doesn't just change your thinking and your believing because soon... It will begin to change. If you're not careful, if you're not solid in what you believe, if you don't stand on it, no matter what your perception of God failing or not around, if you don't stand on that, then He never fails. Amen? If you think your belief is the only thing that may be changing, trust me, your actions will follow. You'll remember that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they've been removed and they're in this foreign country and And I want to just follow up on the last little bit of the previous verses that their names were changed. Now, I did make a joke last week that um, I didn't, and I brought up Kaylee's name, and I said I didn't think about what her name meant when I named her that. I just thought, actually, she was named after someone, and that's the reason she has the name Kaylee. Later, she corrected me, and she said, I just want you to know that Kaylee means keeper of the keys. I don't know what that means. I don't know how that applies to our house. I have an extra key so that when she loses her keys, I have that for her. My point was that I didn't name her based upon some greater meaning. I know I'm not a good parent. Some of you did that, and I didn't. But they did. They named their kids, God is my judge, God is gracious, who is like God, God is my helper. And then Babylon, again, they want to remove God, and so they changed their names, and let me help you out of what they changed them to. They wanted to make sure that we're going to remove God from everything. We've removed them from their culture. We're going to remove God by the way we teach them. We're going to remove God from their very names and give them names that refer to foreign or false gods. This is going to be complete immersion. No sprinkling here. Complete immersion. Some of you got that joke. Some of you didn't. Complete immersion in a new culture. You're going to learn a new language, a new literature, new names, new land, everything. This is, this is about removing God. If God is gone and you think that only calls you a crisis in belief, trust me, it gets worse. Because Babylon is about to do to these kids what the world does to us all the time, and we allow it. Immerse us in other things. So here's the pressure for Daniel. Here... Daniel, eat this defiled food. It's just a little thing. It's just food. We know from the New Testament it's just, it's just food. I mean, later, I mean, even things that the Lord said you can't eat, he says, look, that's, that's really not important. That's not the point. It's just food. Eat this food. Now, many have tried to figure out what what made the food defiled. Some have said, well, it's because Daniel was a vegetarian. No, he was not. Let me just go ahead and declare that. And one of the reasons that we don't believe that he was a vegetarian is there's nowhere in the Old Testament that commanded them to not drink wine and to not have meat. That's not, it's not anywhere in the Old Testament. But the other reason that I don't believe that's the issue is that in chapter 10, Daniel fasted from meat and wine for a period of time. So if you're going to fast from it, you have to be consuming it prior to that. So he fasted. If, if you can fast from something that you 
don't eat. I've been fasting from broccoli for 49 years. <laughs> so he's not, it's not because it was meat and wine. That is not the issue. The food was defiled because in that culture, the food was first offered to false gods or the Babylonian gods. And then after it was offered to the gods, it was brought to the king. The king would eat the food after it was offered to the gods. And what is he eating? He's eating the king's food. And he says, I can't do that. Now, I want to bring your attention to a couple of things because if I can bring you back to 1 Peter, we talked about suffering for the Lord. And you remember he talked about 1 Peter. Peter, the apostle, was talking about what it was to suffer to be in submission to the government, to be in submission to employers. Do you remember that? Y'all can nod your head and make me feel good, okay? And then he talked about also wives be submissive to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Talked about those things. And I want you to see, first of all, how respectful Daniel is. He doesn't say, I'm boycotting the food. You remember one of the things we talked about, about living a life that's, that honors the Lord, is sometimes when we claim that we're suffering for God, we're really suffering because we're jerks. And Daniel doesn't do that. He, notice he's willing to be submissive to the authority that's placed above him. Daniel didn't go and post on social media that how cruel the king was and Babylon was. He, he didn't create a boycott. He didn't try to rally all the youth around him and say, let's do this together because if we all, if we all get together and say we're not going to eat it, then surely they'll, he'll have to change. He simply is very respectful and he asked, can we do something different here? And he's given permission. Let me just say, when you start talking about how you live your faith out at school, teenagers, how you live your faith out at work, adults, how you live your faith out when you have someone over authority of you, this is a great example of, man, I want to live my faith out, but I know I need to be submissive to the authority above me. How do I do that? How do you ask permission? How do you go about it the right way? Can I also point out this is a step of faith. Remember, this is a man, actually a teenager, a young man, who has just seen his culture, his city, his ripped away from his family. He's seen, quote, God fell. At least he didn't come through. He didn't protect Jerusalem. He didn't save him from being taken away from his family. He didn't, he didn't step in and save the day. And so he doesn't really know how this is going to turn out. And faith is about Evidence of what? Things not seen. It's not like Daniel knew, if I do this and it's going to work out this way, then look how good. He, he doesn't know. I mean, we, we, we look at it as history, but you got to know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if he's going to get permission. He doesn't know. He, he's got a 10-day test. He doesn't know, but he has faith that God is going to take care of it. And by the way, we're told he is given favor. God does that. We're going to see in this book time and time again Stepping out on faith. And stepping out on faith means you don't know the outcome. But you trust the one who is constant. I've been wrestling with this sermon for weeks. God has been tugging on my heart. I've been talking to different people about, man, what is this trying to teach me as your pastor? And I pray that you will struggle with it this morning. And you will listen to what the Lord is saying. Let me just remind you, and again, I keep going back to 1 Peter. I, I wish I could say I'm this brilliant pastor. And I looked at 1 Peter and said, man, I love the way this kind of works. And I didn't. But the Lord does know how all of this fits together. Do you remember the very first verse in 1 Peter? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I know this isn't scripture. It's not the word of God. 
But would you just listen to me for just a second? To my brothers and my sisters who are dispersed in Kingwood, in Atascacita, in Summerwood, in Fall Creek, in the Lake Houston area, let me tell you that we are in a foreign land, in a foreign culture. And don't think for a minute that the world is not trying to remove God from our lives so that we have a crisis of belief that somehow if they can create it in such a way that we have a crisis of belief, and guess what? Then we begin to act differently because that's the second warning. You will feel pressure to change how you live when you believe that God is gone. He's feeling the pressure. He is being submissive, but he feels the pressure to just go ahead and eat the defiled food. Why not? Why why make any waves? But I'm going to tell you, we, we, we strive to be a church where we teach scripture and we teach theology and we, we teach you what, what, what God's word say and how we ought to live. But I can tell you, you can learn a bunch of theological facts and you can know a bunch of events in the Bible and you might even claim to be a believer. But what is the point when it comes down to the decisions that we make every single day? Many times we make those decisions like God is gone. They seem to be devoid of our faith in the Lord and what he has said and realize that Daniel's being faithful about food, something that we would think is trivial. Most of us will leave here today and go, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? Okay, you want to eat there? Okay, let's go. No one can make a decision. Great, I'll make a decision. Let's go eat. It's trivial, except to a teenager. And it's not trivial. We are being immersed. Church, listen to me. We are being immersed in a culture And we, as a church, the church is beginning to live like there is no God. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you. We begin to look at our lives. And you may be going, okay, so if that's life, what are these other things? I just was trying to put some things together and say, maybe this is what your life is. And, and you may be going, but there's two you haven't labeled. Well, one, I, yeah, I don't know. Your life is different than my life. I mean, you put whatever that is. And some of you are going, what's that little black square? Is that, is that sin? That's way out of scale, that's sin. <laughs> that's what that is. And some of you are thinking, oh, here we go again. Here's our pastor saying, you, you know, this is the way life should be. We should have more faith. We should go to church more. We should be in church more. Now, that, that's a proportion. But this is not what it should be. This is what it should be. This is what it should be. That on the left is why people are looking at Christians and saying, what do I need it for? Matter of fact, I can get rid of two of those boxes and I have more of my life to do what I want to do. We have become people who have compartmentalized our lives in such a way that we make choices that look nothing like what we've been called to be, nothing like what we profess to be, and nothing like what we believe in. Let me tell you what the picture on the left allows us to do. The picture on the left allows us to sing songs that has filthy language in it, that has sexual innuendos in it. It allows us to watch movies that are filled with filth and think nothing of it and then grab our Bible on Sunday like it's a prop. The picture on the left allows us to pull up porn on our computers and then get in the car the next morning and turn on KSBJ because those are two different things 
The picture on the left allows us, when we're driving down 59, to call the person who cuts us off a name that you would never utter on these premises. The picture on the left allows you to conduct yourself as a thief, a liar, and a cutthroat businessman or woman Monday through Friday, but come to church smiling on Sunday. The picture on the left allows us to post and repost things on social media without any regard to the content of it, to the language in it, and anything that it says about Christ, even though we say we are in Christ and Christ is in us. It allows us to go do many things on Wednesday night because we think those things are beneficial to us rather than being obedient to the Lord. The picture on the left allows us to be kind to our friends, hugging and smiling when we see them, and then when they turn their backs, we can gossip and destroy them later. The picture on the left is why we say that we belong to the Lord, but then we dress like our bodies are available for everyone else. The picture on the left allows us to laugh at jokes that are crude and completely inappropriate and degrading to other people, and yet we say, God loves you. The picture on the left allows us to be selfish with our money, allows us to take every penny and enhance our lifestyle and lets us move up in society. But then we go on a mission trip and act like we care about the orphan, the widow, and the poor. The picture on the left allows us to keep our faith to ourselves while neglecting our children and watching them make decisions that simply appears that we act like God is gone. And then we wonder why people are not attracted to Christianity. It's because of the way we have displayed it. It's been said that the Christians ought to have faith like Muslims, Muslims and evangelize like Mormons. And I know I'll get an email or two for this, if not more. But it's amazing that Muslims work for something that they'll never get while we've been given it and we never deserved it. And Muslims' faith molds their life in such a way that they will do horrible acts because they believe their faith is more important than their very lives. And yet, we can't even get up for church on Sunday morning. I'm not advocating violence, and no doubt, it's a false faith, but they believe it. What do we believe? Daniel's willing to put himself on the line, and he's not doing it because he's got a lot of people behind him. By the way, other youths did not follow him. Other youths weren't doing this. How did they make the comparison? But he and his four friends said, okay, we're going to do this. We don't know how it's going to turn out. But what we do know is our faith is in the Lord. And even though you're going to try to remove him, we will not allow him to be removed. For this church, for you, for me, for our families, for our friends, for our co-workers, our neighbors. All the theological jargon and doctrinal instruction about consecration, righteousness, and holiness comes down to the decisions we are making each and every day. This is not what we're called to. We're called to that. We are not called to live a life with faith. We are called for our faith to be our lives. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. 
Everything that we do, all the decisions that we make, all the things that we hold dear and precious, all of that is wrapped up in our faith. All of it, all of the decisions that you make, when you get up tomorrow morning, what you begin putting into your body, what you begin listening to on the radio or, or on Pandora or whatever media, whatever you begin to put into your head, that is a reflection of where your faith is. When you go to school tomorrow and you have a choice, do I look on this paper or do I not? You are living out your faith. Well, I don't know what the outcome will be if I just go with my own knowledge. Neither did Daniel. Men and women, when you go to work tomorrow, the way you treat your fellow employee, the way you treat your customer, that is a reflection of your faith. And where is it? Is it just a little spot in your life or is it your life? When you go home tomorrow and you are interacting with your family, the way that you love your wife, the way that you love your husband, the way that you interact and love your kids, that is a reflection of your faith. Are you living a life of faith? Are you living a faith that is your life? At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. We are to live not just every seven days. I'll I'll, I'll see if I can make it to church. Depends on what else is going on. You know... I don't, I don't get tickets to the Texans very often, but come on. You know, Paul, I, I mean, it, all I have to do is fudge the numbers a little bit. And man, th- think what, if I got this, what I could give to the Lord, what I could give back to the church. Now, I know there's a little bit of, of fudging here and faking here and falsifying here. But man, I, I just want you to know, I'm going to tithe off of it. As if God is going to be honored by that. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were in better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Here are those, the enemies of God trying to remove God. The enemies of God trying to remove God. The enemies of God trying to remove God. And literally, God's going, I'm, I'm setting a banquet table in front of the enemies. Man, they think they're going to do this. You live right. You're going to endure times where you don't know. You don't know the outcome. You don't know. It may not be that Daniel knew he, he may not be fatter. It may not be. And we don't know it, what would have happened if he wasn't. What would have happened if he looked worse? Doesn't tell us that, so I'm not going to speculate. But he had already gone through worse. He'd already lost his family. He'd already lost his home. He'd already lost his culture. But what he wasn't going to do is lose his God. So he's already gone through worse. So you can't say, well, you know, would he have been faithful later if this wouldn't have worked out for him? It already didn't work out for him, if you will. It didn't work out that he lost all of that, and yet he stayed faithful. So I can't promise you that tomorrow if you're faithful, if you're going, that's it. I'm not going to just put faith in a box and it's a little portion of my life. It is my life. I can't promise you that tomorrow that it's all going to work out. By the way, and if you're doing that so that it will work out for you, you're doing nothing but manipulating God or trying to. But if it doesn't work out that time, stay faithful. Amen? And if it doesn't work out the next time, stay faithful. Amen? But we got to quit thinking because the world is busy trying to make us think. There is no God. Yesterday, of course, I've been wrestling with this. I know there are decisions I need to make in my own life. 
some things that I've got to stand up for, that I have failed in this area. It was interesting. After immersing myself in this passage, the TV was on, and I went and got some lunch yesterday. And do you know, all of a sudden, it was a movie that I'd seen several times. And all of a sudden, it began to bother me some. We have become so numb to the world because we've been immersed in it. And we've got to quit being numb and immerse ourselves in this. We become so complacent. And let me just go ahead. I, I almost feel like I'm telling you the end of the movie before we get there. And I'm referring back to Daniel. But do you know how many times I've heard people say, man, I wish I had the, the faith of Daniel in the lion's den. Man, I wish, I wish I could be like that. Dude, it started with food. He wasn't put in the lion's den at 15. It started with food. If you're going to have the faith, because who knows what you're going to face in life. Trust me, you don't know. But if you're going to have the faith to go through whatever the Lord chooses to orchestrate, I want to go back, He orchestrated this, you better start being faithful with the little things, with the food. Please don't take that literally, okay? but the little things. Teenagers, look right here. There's some of the music you're listening to. You need to cut it off right now. I know it's got a good beat. Good night. I'm a drummer. I love to play drums. I know what a good beat. I mean, I love it when I hear a song. It's got a good groove to it. Douglas and I, there's times like, you got to hear this song. It's got such a good groove. But the things that they're saying in these songs, you got to turn it off. And put it out of your life. And adults, we've moved on. And that's not the temptation for us, many of us. We're not listening to... We're not listening to the hip and happening music anymore. By the way, some of our music... I know you're going... You didn't even say that right. (laughs) I'm turning 50. Give me a break. (laughs) But you know where they got their lead from? Us. Because we, they see us watching movies and, and, and some of the music. I mean, I'm a product of the 80s. Maybe the 80s music didn't say some of the words. All the innuendos are there. All of them. I know some of you are going, are you telling us to burn CDs? I am hip enough to know that they don't have CDs anymore. <laughs> I'm saying that. I know I'm not the only one in this room that needs to make some changes and be faithful with some little things before we're ever going to be faithful with the bigger things. Maybe there's some magazines and books. And, and by the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be porn mags. It could just be simply books that have Messages that you just don't need to be reading. You need to get rid of them. But if you think that when you come to this crisis of belief because things didn't work out the way you thought they should and it begins to make you question, did God fail me? The very next thing is, you know what? He's not even here. And so I'm going to live my life the best way that I know how for my happiness and satisfaction rather than I'm going to live a life that faith is my life to honor the Lord. So this morning, I just want you to know, if you have rejected Jesus Christ, we're not even in the same ballgame right now. You and I are not even on the same field. You've already rejected the holiness of of the Lord by saying, I reject his son. I don't believe in him. I don't have faith in him. I don't trust him. I'm just going to do it the best way that I can for what I know. 
And I want you to know you need Christ because you, like me, we are sinners. We fail miserably. We have not met the standards of God, which, by the way, is perfection. He is holy and perfect. We are not. And because He's holy and perfect, He cannot accept anything that is not holy and perfect. And so because I failed, because I'm a sinner, Jesus Christ is holy and perfect, and He died for me, and He gives me His perfection. He gives me His righteousness. And so when I stand before the Lord, I go, I'm not holy and perfect. And Jesus goes, but I am, and I stood in for Him. So welcome Him in. So you need Christ as your Lord and Savior. But to my brothers and sisters, you and I, we've got to quit living like God is gone. Being immersed in this culture and just saying, you know what, it's just a little, it's just a song. It's just a movie. It's just a word I said in my car by myself. It's not a big deal. It's just a little bit of a fudge on the numbers. I just cheated on one question. we got to be faithful with the little things. Because where are we going to be as a church? Where are we going to be as individuals when the big things come? And are we going to have the faith of Daniel in the lion's den? So what is the Lord telling you to do? Some of you I've known for many years. And you look at that list that I just read to you about how life is when faith isn't your life, it's your life is and faith is just a box and you could go, Paul, I've seen you act like that. I know. And I'm ashamed. But I know I'm not alone. So do you walk out here and just go, still going to do the same old, same old? Or do you walk out here and go, you know what? I'm going to start being faithful right now with just the food. Just the food. So we're going to have an invitation. Andy's going to come up and lead us in song. But I say this all the time. Don't get lost in this song. Let him lead us. Let him sing over us. But you need to deal with the Lord. Because some of you and, and some of us, what we're doing is we're going, I'll just eat the defiled food. It doesn't really make a difference. And it does. Because I don't know, if Daniel would have compromised here, would he have compromised later? But a lot more was on the line. So what is the Lord telling you to do? Maybe you need to grab your spouse and say, we've got to make some changes. We've got to do some things differently. Teenagers, maybe you need to grab a friend. Maybe you need to come by yourself and say, you know what? That, that's it. This part of my life, I, have got to, I am not living like a child of God. So what will you do? In that box of life, I had that one square that said, I don't know. I still don't know what the Lord is doing with you, but you do. So you deal with the Lord. And let's make our faith more important than our life. Amen? Amen? Thank goodness that the Lord, that Christ thought of us more than his life. So what is the Lord telling you to do? I've already shared with the elders. I confess to them some things I've got to do different. Maybe it's time for you to grab your friend and say, I I need you to hold me accountable. I need you to help me do what I know the Lord is telling me to do. You respond to them. You don't have to come pray with me. If you want to, that's great. But maybe there's someone else you need to grab. The altar's open. The front row is open. You do what the Lord is telling you to do this morning. Let's pray.